Hello, you wonderful people, and welcome to another episode of Not Too Comic Book. This being a show where I talk about TV shows that are adaptations of comic books. For today's episode, I'm going to talk about the latest episode of Riverdale. Quite a few things to break down about this episode. So first of all, let's talk about, you know, start off with uh, Jughead and Betty doing their kind of investigation. Uh, essentially, they kind of divide and conquer uh Jughead handles the game side of things because they come to the same conclusion. At least Betty comes initially to the same conclusion I did that maybe this whole Edgar uh, and farm situation is connected to this uh, Gargoyle King situation. So Ethel brings Jughead in, which I think is so interesting because now it's like because she was saying Betty would it wouldn't be a big fit for Betty, but she was willing to give Jughead a, a chance. The question is why? It seems like that was more so a specifically planned thing. Because what was so specific about you needed Jughead to be the one to do it and not Jughead and Betty? One maybe because if they were both together, Jughead would have not gone to such lengths. Or at the very least, they both would have. And it's just, it, you needed a, a divide and conquer. Um, it's like where they think they're divided and conquering to tackle this task. You're technically divided and conquering them without them really knowing. Is that what that's supposed to be? I don't know. Because uh, ultimately, he goes through it. The whole him being a Hellcaster thing, which is also the role that Ben played. Because there's no, none of this has really come up too much. Because apparently, it's been like three weeks since the events of last week's episode with Ben killing himself. I don't even think I even talked about that in last week's episode. I forgot to kind of talk about that. But the whole aspect. And that's what really bothered Betty. Because it's like, he didn't scream or anything. He was just, he embraced it so much. So it's like... Are they almost like on some hallucinogenic? Is something being pumped into them? Are they being hypnotized? Like what is going on that they're so okay with everything? Because Ethel is creepy in this episode where it's just kind of like, oh, I'll give you this manual, but you have to play the roles. Like it's, she's so like, oh, don't even call me that name in the game because you're not worthy to call me that because you're not a part of this and everything. And it's like, what? Even going as far as like, oh, you have to kiss me because it's part of the game. It's like, you're taking this a little too seriously. You're even making it two cups. Like considering the situation that recently went down with Ben and Dilton, you're still doing this. It's like, what, what the hell is up with that? Even to the point, even when Jughead took it and drunk the right one, she drunk the other one because it's like, is she trying to join them in this kingdom, which I'm suppose I'm guessing it's supposed to be some form of an afterlife, maybe not necessarily heaven, but maybe some like uh, something similar to it in some regard. I don't know, but it's definitely some deep level cult brainwashing for Ethel to go to the extent that she's done because even at the end of it all being like, oh, the game has only just begun and just the look on her face like she's like not the Ethel you've come to know so far across the show. It's almost like she's a different person because she's so like sucked into this world. Like the the boundaries between what is game and reality is so blurred at this point, in particular for her, for the others as well. Because uh, at least Dilton seemed like, oh, I, like he had some reluctancy with this. It seems like Ethel doesn't. It seems like her and Ben are full on. And the question is why? What was so different about their situations that even because Dilton didn't want to go forward with everything. So that makes you go, okay, what was different about his circumstances? Why wasn't he kind of getting sucked in, into all of this? Maybe it's, some, maybe it's just who he is personality-wise. Because... You know, Ethel and Ben might have had their issues where it's kind of like they're a lot more susceptible. Maybe Dilton wasn't as much, but maybe it just got to the point he was too deep into the game that he couldn't pull out or what. Or maybe there was kind of a force situation. Because initially, Ethel was like, oh, like Ben was supposed to finish the game with her, but he hurried up and he finished with Dilton. So, I mean, meaning that things could have easily turned out a very different way in that regard, but I have no idea what's going on with that whole situation. Because while that's all happening, you have Betty um, cozying up to Evelyn, which interesting enough, I don't remember if I brought this up last episode. I was thinking about it, but now that I'm looking at the actress, I'm fairly certain of it. It's the actress who plays Evelyn is the same actress because I had to look up the name because I couldn't remember her name because it's been a while. But Gracie from Orphan Black, it's totally her. I didn't check the actress's name. I just couldn't remember the character's name. But looking at it, it's like, that's totally her, which is like, oh my God, that, ah, that's so cool. Uh, so there's that. And I was like... Okay, so Betty's pretending to kind of get close to her. It seems like they kind of might have some... Because it's interesting because it doesn't seem like they've even got like a herbal approach. Because it's like, oh, we're trying to get Ethel off the medication. But it's like, you're not offering any substitute in a sense of like a herbal medicine. Or like something, you know, something Eastern or something more natural. It's like, no, you're just trying to offer the teachings, which is interesting. 
which is, I'm wondering how does that collide, especially considering the condition that Ethel's in right now. I mean, maybe to be fair, like to everyone outside of all this, Ethel's acting normal to a certain degree. Maybe. Uh, I have no idea because like for her and uh, Evelyn to be okay. I mean, Evelyn visited her and everything when she was in. Nevertheless, um, but uh, apparently there's a, a system to this whole thing uh, with the farm. It's like you have to work your way up before you can meet with Edgar. And there's this whole like talking to everyone, meet the other people from the farm. And it's like, oh, you have to confess in front of them, like stuff that you know about yourself. And Evelyn being like, oh, we already know so much about you. It's like, uh, excuse me? Oh, yeah, your mom's pretty much told us everything about the, the chick situation as well as all that uh, disposing of a body. And then Betty's like, you what? And then it ends up coming up about the whole uh, game thing, which even Alice is like, because she wasn't expecting them to talk about it, which is interesting. You have so much faith in them to bring up something that – you told them in confidence because she's so being like, oh, no, no, no. They won't say anything to anybody. That's why it's like it's something you prompt the others. You and the others promise each other that you wouldn't say a word to anyone about it. But you're telling this group, which I guess shows you how warped her mind is. That something that she and the group is so hesitant about ever talking about trying to bury in the past that she's even willing to talk to this group about it. I think speaks volumes about kind of what she, kind of mind state, just what this whole situation turns into. But for Betty, it's kind of like, no, 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 you know more about this than you're letting on. What's also interesting is that Betty starts kind of getting a little dizzy, but then she kind of stops herself. So it seems like she was about to pass out again or maybe have some seizures. So it's like, what's up with that? Like, like there must be some, like legitimately there might be something like legit wrong with Betty in the sense of like in the, like we might be seeing like something's in her head like a tumor or something like like doing that like I thought she was lying with Evelyn when she was talking about like oh like she was having seizures once or twice a day I thought she was there might there might have actually been some truth to that like she might still be having the seizures but it seemed like that was like the only one I mean at least that we've seen on camera subsequently since she passed out in the premiere so that turns into the whole thing I'm like okay so what's up with that or is it just because it's just like it seems like it happens at very interesting points in times like when big stuff happens like that it just seemed like we saw what triggered it in the premiere but now we see it's happening here where it's just kind of like i think when she finds a little balance and when she kind of gets knocked off balance it seems like that's when it happens but maybe it just happens to be a coincidence because whatever maybe the stress is aggravating her condition Whatever it is, like maybe it is something in her brain, maybe just something in her body in general, but like her elevated stress must be triggering something in her body to make that keep happening. But her mom even having the audacity to be like, oh, I trust them more than I trust you. You, the girl who is my own daughter, I trust more these people. I don't really know that well more than I trust you, which is like that doesn't make a lot of sense to me, but okay. Especially considering the fact is like, Alice being, you know, her and how having like the paper like they did is kind of like Betty's literally a copy of you kind of always digging at the truth. And it's like you're almost damning her for it now, which is so interesting to me because she's literally almost following in your footsteps in many different regards because I brought it up before because you went down the serpent route and she's kind of going down that route herself. It's like literally Betty, it's you. Also, what pisses Betty off too, it's like her mom had the audacity to tell the uh, people at the farm. I mean, who's to say it wasn't also um, Polly who did it, but it's like the wigs and the webcamming. It's like, dude, come on. Like, because that's so interesting because it's like, oh, it's all about talking about yourself because they're like, oh, this has nothing to do with your mom's past. This is about you. But it's like her mom literally sat there and ran her mouth off about Betty's situation. It's like, don't you think that's a little messed up? You don't want to talk about your situation. You don't want Betty bringing it up and stuff like that. But you feel free to talk about every, Betty's other stuff, too, because for Betty, it's like, you know, you're implicating me, Jug and FP in this situation, especially because her and FP are kind of hitting it off. I wonder what FP's got to say about that when it all kind of circles back. Like, Betty's like, uh, you know my mom told those foreign people about everything about what happened last season. And then FP like, wait, you did? What? Oh, you also know they told, she also told him about the game, right? Wait, you what? I'm curious to see what happens in. I want to see what Alice's reaction is there because it seems like, oh, everything's good between them. It's like, oh, they got good in her life. And it's just like, no, nah. it seems like that might not last, especially like, you know, once FP potentially finds out that truth about them. We'll, we'll see it in the end, but 
The crazy twist is that Ethel has spread the game everywhere because she printed it beforehand because it's like, oh, they burned the only copy, which once again is kind of like, what did you do that was so bad when you played this game all those years ago? Obviously, you had to have played the game. Then why are you so hesitant about Jughead investigating? Like, you don't want them to play the game and stuff. I get that. I guess, like, it gets so seductive and it's something evil. It's kind of all they're describing, but it's like, these are your kids, your kids who have faced evil before, ranging from everything dealing with Jason's murder to the Black Hood and facing off against Hiram Lodge. Kind of don't get a lot more evil than all of that. And your kids have faced that and they are still standing today. I mean, granted, there's complications when it comes to the whole Archie thing in that same regard. But still, like, you should be looking at this as like, no, 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 they're the ones that's trying to unravel the truth. I mean, to be fair, it's a truth that you don't want unravel unraveled, so it makes sense. But with it spreading like that, I'm curious to see what this group, this group of secret keepers have to say about this. Like, you can't keep it secret much longer because now it's spreading like wildfire. Because even Joe gets saying over the like the VO of like, oh yeah, like literally everyone in his school is playing it now. Which is also interesting because there's all the aspect of like Evelyn is starting a branch, a chapter of the farm at Riverdale. There's not a lot of people there. There was no one there at first, but it makes you wonder, are we going to see like, like I said, it seems like now it's like, maybe they aren't connected, the whole Gargoyle King and the, you know, uh, farm situation. So it seems like they probably are like two different cult things maybe the farm thing won't be as bad as you think it is but just initially it's just kind of like yeah i'm not not too trusting it at farm thing definitely is trusting about this whole gargoyle thing king uh gargoyle king thing so it's like what's that all about we'll kind of have to wait and see um another side of this episode dealt with veronica opening her speakeasy it's actually kind of sad because it's like for her it's like she did she's it's been ready for a while but she hasn't opened it because she wanted it to be like such a special occasion because she wanted Archie to be there and like us dancing for the opening but it's like this is what Art Betty's like this is what Archie told you exactly not to do don't put your life on hold for him is what he said he wants you to live your life so she opens the speakeasy I do love that like I guess like Reggie's kind of like the enforcer slash bouncer slash business partner in the whole situation kind of bartender I guess in that regard, so I thought that's kind of nice. You have um, Josie being, uh, you know, uh, kind of the headliner music guy, which is interesting because she brought up, yeah, it's like, oh, I've been waiting for an opportunity since I went solo. I was like, right, I forgot that was such an issue last season because the the Pussycats found out about you doing that and they got super pissed. Which subsequently, it's like they have not popped up either, so it makes you wonder, like. What about the Pussycats? Like, will we see kind of a resurgence of that? I feel like because you can't have Josie without the Pussycats. I mean, you could, but I don't know. It's just kind of, it's that thing of like, huh. you know, I mean, to be fair, I don't know the characters that well. I know them for a little bit from like the old school cartoon, but that's about it. I don't even remember the live action movie that well. But nevertheless, it's just kind of, I'm curious to see what ends up circling around with that. Because like I said, I just completely, I was like, right, right, right. You went all solo and everything. The others got super pissed about that. Because they were more pissed by the fact is that she went behind their backs to do it. It's like, if you did it, if told us up front, we would have been cool with it. But you went behind our backs. You know, so that was kind of the shady aspect to it. Uh, Veronica having to go toe-to-toe with her dad. Because her dad is basically sending Penny slash the ghoulies there as well as Sheriff Moneta setting them up with all that uh jingle jangle and trying you know trying to extort money from them. This is all you know I doubt it's their decision. I'm sure the decision came from Hiram. He is the one that kind of runs operations. I'm sure they kind of do their own things, but it all comes that they probably don't make a move without Hiram's decision. You know, so it's like, I guess this is further trying to teach his daughter a point because like every time he turns around, it's like they're already in a bad place with each other. But he's like, every time he turns around, she's doing more and more, which you do see that on some level when she ends up getting it like her, uh, Tony and Cheryl end up blackmailing him, more so Veronica, but obviously they helped out get all those photos of the Jingle Jangle lab at the White Worm to kind of blackmail him. He was actually almost impressed with her way of doing things because I think Hiram is enjoying the situation because I think he feels like he's pushing Veronica more and more into a corner to the point that she'll either, even if she doesn't submit, ultimately she'll be a different person so that 
she'll kind of become more like him and leave Archie behind on her own. Or maybe he'll feel like maybe he can, thinks he can shift her enough that she'll become a very different person. She'll do stuff that she won't be able to cross back over from. And it's like Archie was worried about that. But look, you're the one that crossed the line that you can't come back from. And Archie will never accept you. So you got to leave him behind because he'll never. That's how far I'm thinking about it. Doesn't mean that's necessarily how he's thinking about it. But this is all like game to him. But, um, yeah, it's just this back and forth, and you just feel like Veronica just kind of feels like she's, you know, it's just, it's almost like there's no winning. Because it's so interesting, because she was so willing to give her dad a benefit of the doubt last season. She was working with everything that he was doing, because she believed in it, and it's just kind of like, oh, everything's out and above board. But then she, you know, realized the more and more shady stuff that her dad was into and stuff like that, especially dragging Archie down that route. You know, because Archie did a lot of that stuff for her. He had his other personal reasons, too, but it was mainly for her because he loved her. So now after all of that, it's just I'm curious to see where the things go because things are going to get ugly, especially because Hiram has the power pool and connection, which Veronica's got her own connections because he's got the ghoulie because Hiram's got the ghoulies as well as uh, Chef Manette on her on, her, on his side. Uh, still, you know, the her whole Hermione situation, like where she stands. She's kind of caught in the middle in this like family feud, this family civil war. And so it's ultimately going to be interesting in the end what side she does choose. Because she kind of has no choice but to take Hiram's side because she's legitimately scared. They got to be taken out of the picture in that regard. Plus, you know, it's kind of like as Mary had probably, you know, it's a lot kind of resting on her shoulder. So she can't help out Veronica like she probably would want to. I th- obviously, I think she could be on anyone's side. It's more so Veronica's, which is so interesting because I would have so, like, the way she was in season two, you're like, oh, she's 100% on Hiram's side. It's like, no. She has just as much issue with Hiram as anyone else, but it's just kind of the way things are. This is the family she married into, and it's a situation that I guess she kind of feels like she's in too deep. Yeah, it's, it's definitely going to be interesting going forward with that. But because at least with Veronica, she has the serpents backing her because they don't like the ghoulies. They don't like um, Hiram either. So there's at least one person on her side. There's some people probably at, you know, with Reggie at the helms is like the bulldogs are on her side too. So she's got an army of her own too. But, you know, it's so interesting, especially considering like, you know, Archie was making an army of his own, the Red Circle. I mean, that was all kind of for Hiram to a certain extent. But now it's kind of like now the kind of tables have turned. And now Veronica's kind of taken over that for Archie, but also still being a lodge. And with the Bulldogs potentially being by her side and the server. It's just it, it's just interesting setup with all that. So I'm very interested to see kind of where all that goes, like where things, kind of, you know, things are only going to escalate from here. Um Cause we haven't really seen every move. Like subsequently, this I mean, obviously we're just starting off this season, but it's like we're not a hundred percent sure what it is exactly. Like you know, Hiram has planned with all these different groups, like the Ghoulies and Penny, as well as Minetta. Like what's going to go down and with all of that. So we'll have to wait and see. And then there's a side of things with Archie. It turns out the Warden. Locked him up in um, solitary confinement for like the past three weeks. Won't even let his dad see him. Uh, blaming him for the riots and everything again. And you even have uh, Archie's dad being like, oh, I'm going to bring my lawyer. I'm wondering if he's talking about um, Mary or not. I mean, she's out of town, but, you know, with such a severe situation, it's probably like, yeah, we got to bring in the big guns for this. Or it might be some more local I, I mean, the thing is, I feel like you couldn't trust any local lawyer because it's like, Hiram pretty much runs and controls everything and everyone related to Riverdale. So it's kind of like you can't trust anyone to necessarily 100% be on your side. But Archie's basically been put into a fight club. Basically, they have all the the some of the prisoners there in a fight club. The uh, uh, prison guards bet on it. And there's also tickets being sold. So there are there are people outside of this situation being brought in, which is kind of like, man, how much of garbage human beings do you have to be to kind of be like, oh, so excited for this, but not say anything about it? Like, like the question is, and then that was kind of what wandered through my mind. Are they just regular people? Or are we talking these people with power and money type of thing? The fact of the matter is everyone's getting a little bloodthirsty. I mean, maybe they're just in general just sick, twisted people. But I'm probably thinking there might be at least some, not all of them, but maybe some kind of like pe- people in powerful position, like maybe like 
governors or mayors type of situations, like people with power and reach coming to watch these games too. Maybe not all the time, maybe some of the time. Because the warden was talking about at one point, didn't he say like he's going to a party related to the governor and he was telling Archie like, oh yeah, like think about this when you get back. Because Archie made quick work of that fight. He didn't please the warden because the warden likes to make these fights lengthy. The only reason why Archie's doing all this in the first place is because the warden forced his hand. Like he made uh, Joaquin participate in a fight and he's like oh so either he can rest safely in his cell or you can just you know or he could end up in the infirmary on life support which is kind of like jeez dude like holy crap like i know prison's not that great but holy crap dude because also this isn't even prison this is like a juvenile center i mean detention center and it's like man you were going crazy and hard especially because those fights too get bloody like archie and I thought that was kind of interesting dynamic in the sense of like Archie, because his dad doesn't directly, his dad was in the cell with him. I'm like, that's not true of your dad. There's no way the warden would have actually let you see your dad. So this is in your head. It's like, or did he? Is it? And it's like, nope, it is in all in your head. And so Archie tries to find a way around it. So he lets the guy beat on him a little bit to make the fight seem exciting. But it was all for the purposes. Uh, you know, Archie ends it pretty quickly because he's not trying to drag it out. He's not trying to become this a mad dog like, you know, in a sense of like, does, he's not trying to become the animal Mad Dog was suggesting he become or the, what the warden wants him to be. So obviously he wins. He's getting some of the perks. But the problem is like what really set him off is that the wine that or alcohol that the uh, warden gave him was from Hiram. And it just pisses him off because it's like because Archie came in here because he thought like, hey, I'm going to pay for what I did. You know, he didn't, you know, he didn't, he knew things kind of sucked, but he's like, hey, I deserve this. He didn't know that Hiram was going to screw him over even more by stacking everything against him. It's like, if I have to serve out this punishment, I will. But it's like, Hiram's not even making it fair. It's like, I think now Archie's at the point where he's no longer blaming himself for everything. I think he's like, nah, screw it. This is all Hiram's fault because all he could think about was Hiram just being there when he gets arrested at the courtroom. Just it just and just seeing his name, thinking about him pisses him off so much, so much he had to sacrifice for the people he loves so that he wouldn't drag them down. And it's just like that bastard is just screwing me over at every point in time. I just want to. Do this, pay for what I've done, and return to the people I love. But he won't let me. He's put me in this terrible situation. So that, to me, I think it's going to be very interesting when it eventually comes down to it. Hiram is creating his own issue. Like Arch, Archie told him last season, you come, you cross me, I will come after you. It's like you're putting him in a situation that's going to turn him into a completely different animal on his own. And you want it that, you know, it's like, it's one thing to have Archie as an ally, but it's a different thing to have him as an enemy, especially with what the situation you're forcing him into be, like what that's going to do and how that's going to change Archie. We've already seen Archie's dark side and seeing this dark side that you're kind of beating into him. He's not going to be the kid that, you know, was willing to go about things a different route. Like he might, things might get ugly when it comes to him and Hiram going forward if they cross paths after this all being said and done, whatever point in time it is like whether he is the Archie Andrews that managed to stay who he was or someone who got turned into a mad dog we'll just have to wait and see in that because we do see him getting a lot of uh mad dogs hand-me-downs and one was kind of like there was a um what was the exact word he used it was like it's like a little hammer and it, it was like shaped in the book because it was kind of like a reminder of like there's some there's a world out there outside of these walls that we we can get to it. We can't give up on who we are. So he talks to the others, uh, Baby Teeth, uh, Thumper and Peter and Joaquin about the whole situation of like as some I, he doesn't know how, but they're all going to get out of here. Uh, which part of me goes, I hope Joaquin doesn't turn out to be like. Uh, undercover that basically to make things easier for himself because the warden can make things hard for everybody I hope he isn't trying to snitch on Archie just for the purposes I mean you if he did does you can't blame him but I kind of feel like I hope that's not the route that ends up going we'll ultimately see what ends up happening there because I think it's probably going to eventually get to the point where uh, the warden is going to kind of force Archie's team against him either going to force Archie to eventually fight his team all of them or at the very least make them turn on him or him on them, like whatever the situation may be. So like there is a lot to digest about this episode, like I said. So I'm so interested to see where 
all of this is going to take us in the next episode with all of this. But really, that's all I want to talk about. Until the next time we meet, be happy, be safe, love like to the fullest, and enjoy it. Good day and goodbye.